Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Go to focuscompounding.com to get access to our investment write-ups going all the way back to 2005. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, either through the fund or managed accounts, uh, reach out to me at andrewfocuscompounding.com. The qualifications are different for those vehicles, um, uh, but we have something for um, basically everybody, I guess you could say, as long as you qualify. And we can start that conversation by reaching out to me, andrewfocuscompounding.com. And of course, the best place to get access to everything that we push out into the investing universe is to follow me on Twitter at, at or excuse me, when, when should I start calling it X, X Jeff? Yeah. I guess it, what, it, what does uh, Elon say? He goes, Twitter, FKA, like formerly known as, uh, or X, FKA, Twitter. So mm -hmm. X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, at, at Focus Compound. So in today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to... Uh, revisit banks. Uh, it's been a while okay. since we've spoken about banks on the podcast. Um, the Fed uh, has indicated that perhaps interest rate cuts are on the table. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is starting to be priced into the market. You have prominent investors, uh, smart investors betting on a cut in Q1. Um, Bill Ackman, who actually made money on higher interest rates and then he covered that trade, I guess, basically perfectly and went the other way. I mean, he thinks that they're going to have to cut rates in Q1. Um, from my perspective, it appears so far that we actually are on track for a soft landing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these interest rate uh, rises and whether they cause a recession, you know, that could take probably about a year and a half to two years to work its way through the economy. So who knows what's going to happen? Um but the market, as you can see right here, if you're watching on the screen, this is the U.S. Treasury yield curve. Looks like it's pricing in rate cuts starting about six months from now, or really three months mm -hmm. from now. So I guess that's that's in Q1 and then progressively throughout 2024. So I wanted to bring banking up again. It's been a while since we've spoken about it on the podcast. Um, curious to hear your, your thoughts on the banking industry and how it relates to the current yield curve and the forward curve and how you're just typically thinking about it. And perhaps you have a few different um, ideas of banks that are going to benefit um, from rates coming down and ones that may have more of a challenging time uh, with rates going down. So just curious to hear your thoughts on the overall banking environment. Sure. So of the banks that we've talked about regularly, um, a, a prototypical example of a bank that would benefit from um, a more... Uh, positively sloped yield curve, you know, um, th where longer term um, rates are higher and shorter term ones are lower um, would be something like Hingham, HIFS. And an example of one that would not benefit that much from that would be something like Frost, CFR. Um, I think Hingham's up maybe 16% or something since the rate decision and Frost maybe eight or something. Um, they all move together like when the decision happened and stuff, but then, you know, the next day and everything Hingham kept going up. So that kind of movement that you see the next day is more um, realistic. Uh, when I looked at the actual decision um, and the movement in stocks, it was basically a highly correlated movements between banks that shouldn't be correlated in terms of what their earnings will be. Um, so they just go all in on, um, regional banks that are sort of similar in terms of the um, size of the bank and the exchanges they're on and stuff like that. So it's just very automated, the initial reaction. But um, this is already priced in to some extent in some of these things, right? So like, um, uh, you know, Frost was already actually, the stock w had recovered a bit, but it was down at 90 something. The, the company even bought back some stock, which they never do. And um, that was probably because they're feeling they're already getting to the end of that rate cycle and stuff. Whereas Hingham, which I think got below 160 or something, was starting to do better. 
Um, mm-hmm. So there's already people looking forward on those things. They don't look all that far forward, but six months, I think the market probably does look six months forward on banks. They don't mm-hmm. seem to look, you know, a year or something forward that well. So can you explain for people that aren't familiar with these two banks, the difference of their uh, th- their deposit base and, you know, the loans right. that they make and why uh, Hingham will benefit with lower rates, whereas uh, Frost, you had said, would not benefit? Right. So um, the basically, it has to do with your imbalance, what you're kind of short and what you're kind of long. So... What Hingham is short is uh, stable um, short-term money. So it needs to bring in money that its customers that it actually deals with don't have a lot of lying around. And they always want to borrow. These are like real estate. Um, So they want to borrow long and fixed, and they don't want to deposit a lot of money short and and floating. Um, Whereas something like Frost has two things happening. One is um, that its deposit base is very strong. Um, So yes, over time, the rates going up still move some things from non-interest deposits to interest-bearing deposits to more money market type things to repo type things. But you see that general progression, but they, they have more money than they need on deposit normally. Um, in fact, they've always kept money at the Fed since, you know, the, the last few years. Um, so that's part of it. But then the other side of it is while there are banks like that, that do that on the deposit side, they then go out to and um, they make loans that are maybe more like the loans that Hingham makes. Because Hingham is more similar to like a thrift from, you know, um, 40 years ago or something. Many of them don't really exist anymore. But Hingham is one of the few that has a business model that's still similar to that. Um, so. Because of that, Frost does like CNI lending and stuff, which a lot of that money comes back faster to them. And so you have money that is more short term and that floats. And um, they are going to try to do mortgages. They're testing it. And uh, I I assume that those will be customized somewhat products um, that they will hold on their balance sheet. I don't think they mean that they're intending to do mortgages that they're going to resell that conform and everything, although some of the mortgages may conform. Um, So I'm assuming that they want to increase that over time, uh, just because that's probably a product that some of their customers might want. In the past, they've done um, home equity loans. So, um, but my feeling is the home equity loans were to generate business and stuff um, because of who they focus on. So those are probably business owners and stuff or some of the top people at businesses. Um, So, because I think that's kind of similar to like First Republic, right? like doing mortgage stuff um, with principals or with people who are high up in certain organizations and stuff might be a way that they uh, can use customer service and everything to get business. And that was part of their strategy. And I think that's the same sort of thing with something like Frost. But um, so eventually that would be, then they would have long-term things on their, on their balance sheet. Um, and they have a lot of securities. Most banks that are like Frost would hold more securities without keeping more money at the Fed, but Frost doesn't take as much interest rate risk ever. Um, it's similar to, we talked about progressive and Geico progressive had a bad experience many years ago where they had large investment losses at the same time as a bad underwriting environment. And so that spooked them and the organization since then has, um, had a somewhat different investment policy in terms of, um, rate risks and stuff than a lot of insurers would take. Um, and I, you know, Frost had a, a bad experience in, um, the late 80s, early 90s, um, a banking bust in Texas, which is by far the worst that the state ever had. It, you know, 2008 and stuff was nothing compared to that for Texas. And they only got through that because they had a very low loan to deposit ratio. Um, so mm. since then, they've always kind of kept to that. Completely different banks from that perspective as well, uh, the loan to deposits. I mean, here you have Hingham at one times book value. Uh, ten-year median returns for return on equity fifteen point five percent. Obviously, with rates going up as quickly as they did, Hingham went through a period of a challenging period. Um, but just curious, right? I mean, their return equity really has continued to grow, or their shareholders' equity, I should say, has continued to grow. Mm-hmm. This has been one of the most money, yeah, yeah. This was the most challenging time 
in the company's history. It was probably mm -hmm. the longest yield curve inversion, at least in this company's recent history. Um, I mean, if ever, right? I think I'm right in saying that. It's ever. definitely the longest since control of this company changed. Um, the I don't remember how long the yield curve version was in the early 80s. That's the only one I could think of that competes with this one in terms of length. Uh-huh. So my question is to you, their shareholders' equity continued to grow. It may have you know slowed down, but there's been a lot of talk on if this is a good bank, a bad bank, what. But they definitely just went through the worst hurricane probably since the current management have been in control of this bank. In your eyes, mm -hmm. does that make a case for the durability of this business? Because we're kind of at the point of coming out on the other side and rates are expected to drop. Mm -hmm. So uh, our argument for why you should have bought Frost years ago before rates start to increase is that Frost was going through the worst period there. I mean, no one had thought that you could take rates to zero and leave them there for years. And the bank wasn't built to to um, be highly profitable when that was happening. Now, they, they sometimes earned returns on equity in the uh, very high single digits or low double digits, but it, it halved their earning power. Um, something similar happened to Hingham, where the assumption is that the yield curve can't stay inverted forever. Um, mm -hmm. But look, the we had a very long yield curve inversion. We're still having it right now. And um, we had a very long period where rates were at almost nothing. Um, those might not be... Um, might not be a coincidence that happened, but they're both like events that happened that are unprecedented that way. What people want as investors is they're imagining that somehow the bank can predict the future and navigate all sorts of environments. But the business models that really make a lot of money over time can't do that. They're set up to do one thing. They're optimized for that. Like Hingham has very low expenses, for instance, and um, that is it's very efficient, right? Very, you know, so the efficiency ratio is the lower, the better, and has a very, very low efficiency ratio among the best of any public bank. Um, and that is really good, but then it hurts a lot, as you saw here, where as the, the net interest income comes down, you feel the leverage of that in a bigger way than say if the business was very fee driven or something, you know? Um, Frost was all sensitive to interest rates because it has a lot of assets. It has a lot of, um, it's funding a lot of assets. And so it depends on what the yield is on those assets. And so that's why it did badly for a long time. It's not like they, that Frost was super smart during times when rates were going up and dumb when they were at zero or that that was happening in Hingham either. It was the same strategy. That's, that's what the bank is built to do in both cases. Um, you know, it's the same thing with insurance things and stuff like, you know, Berkshire, people talk about how great it is that they've done all of these things over their um, history, which is true. But they've also at times like reduced their premiums for 10 years or something because they don't have their, their they don't have a strategy for what to do when prices aren't right. Um, and so they just have to live through that. And so sometimes premiums have to drop off by a huge amount. And, you know, sometimes Frost doesn't have a strategy for how to reach for more yield. Uh, Hingham doesn't have a strategy for how to fund itself when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of owning a bank through a full cycle, which one do you think would put up better returns over time? I mean, here you have Colin Frost at 2.3 times book at this price, but mm -hmm. just curious how you think about, you know, if you're not going to trade in and out of these based on the Ford curve and whatnot, what is a good bank to own that is built to weather every storm? And um, is that JP Morgan or, you know, I mean, which no, one would you rather I, own? I wouldn't want to own any of the big banks. I don't think that they'll do as well. I think it's a disadvantage to be one of the biggest banks in the United States. Um, and if you look at JP Morgan, they break down the pieces of their bank and you can see that those pieces that are smaller and that are publicly traded peers are small are the best parts of the bank and the really big parts of the business are the worst parts. So like they have the highest returns and things like all the big banks do in private wealth stuff, CNI stuff for smaller businesses in the community banking stuff that they say, and they have the worst things in investment banking and like wholesale corporate banking and stuff. Um, so you can tell that they aren't the be the biggest scale businesses aren't the best in terms of returns on assets and stuff. Um, Hingham is more, 
optimized, more efficient and everything like that. I mean, they're literally a lot more efficient um, and they're just more optimized in terms of getting good returns. However, I think Hingham is much uh, more requires uh, good execution than something like Frost. You know, we talk about that with, you know, um, uh, you know, their businesses where, you know, to be in a business that even an idiot could run because eventually one will. Um, I definitely think that a business like um, Frost is much more, um, it matters a lot less what decisions they make in running it. Um, and it's more durable that way. Um, there are other things that I think require much higher, uh, much greater skill. And th so that's just, th they're different businesses. I think that private banking, CNI, some other things we've talked about, um, are generally once they have a good franchise are more likely to last for a very long time, earning good returns, regardless of exactly who the management is. They have to not do dumb things. Um, they have to be disciplined in some ways and stuff, but they, it's a lot of common sense and um, doesn't require a lot of extreme skill in uh, execution as much as some of the other business models. So I think that, um, that's easier. But also, um, Frost was already in a position. I mean, th they had much higher expenses and stuff um, 30 years ago or so. So it wasn't earning as well, but it was already built up in terms of a franchise to a position where Hingham was starting from nothing 30 years ago. So it's not like you could do that. It's like asking, you know, well, can I invent C's candies or something? You know, I mean, you can't do it. Um, you know, Frost had been around a hundred some years by then and stuff. So um, it, starting from scratch that you couldn't kind of duplicate the business model and get to the same place. Which bank would you rather own at this point? I mean, do you think there are other banks that are cheaper? Do you think banks in general uh, are, there are, other you banks know, are, are really cheap right now? Mm. I, I don't know. It, it depends. I mean, the, the price to book thing is misleading in both cases. So it looks like Hingham has a very low price to book. It looks like Frost is very high price to book. I don't think price to book is something that I would focus on. I, you know, I've always thought in terms of banks, what's the size of the balance sheet in terms of like deposits and stuff and how um, valuable is it in terms of how low cost. So things that are very high cost, just like an insurance company that runs at a combined ratio of 100, it should trade at a price to book that's close to one with book updated to reflect market values. Um Obviously, stuff with Hingham isn't reflected to re reflect market values. So, you know, the, the loans aren't aren't set to what those could actually be sold for today. Um, so the that exaggerates that, you know, makes it look cheaper on a price to book. Um, uh, you know, I don't think that it's really that important that you have a lot of equity and stuff. Frost had mentioned in the earnings calls that one reason they were reluctant to buy back a lot of stock was that I think analysts and stuff talk to them about tangible equity and they're very low on tangible equity. So um, that would hurt that. If you buy above book value, you're hurting the tangible equity um, situation. Um, there, you know, there are all sorts of different banks and you would have to look to see what, what would, um, what their business model is, understand the management and all of that. There are certainly many banks that are much, much cheaper. Um, that, you know, Hingham is very cheap versus its peak earnings, you know, recently. So that's one way of looking at it is what did it peak at, average earnings, all those sorts of things. And it's very reasonable on those kinds of prices, obviously. Um, Frost is at peak earnings, so it's not so reasonable, although the P isn't high. Um, so, I mean, Frost is probably 25 times the earnings that it had not long before COVID. And, um, but it's only 10 times or something recent earnings. And hang on, what do you have in terms of their peak EPS and when it was? We have peak EPS of $30.65 in 2021. I think that includes some non-core stuff, right? I think that maybe it would be $6 or less below that. Um, but I could be wrong. You know, the, the QuickFS stuff is going to obviously report things, including gains and losses on security stuff, on realized and stuff, which I think the bank strips out. Um, but it had, so what were its three highest years? Let's go with that. Uh, we have $30.65 in 2021, 
uh, twenty three dollars twenty five cents in twenty twenty, and seventeen dollars and eighty three cents in twenty nineteen. So really, period from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty one. Yeah. So you're talking about they are trading at eight, let's say like nine times at the most. Their peak earnings is taking like a three year average, and Frost, if you're taking the most recent one, is also like nine times or maybe a little bit more now or something. But so they're both not that different if you think of that if people are kind of thinking in terms of peaks and stuff, there's lots of different ways of thinking about it, but for businesses thinking of what the averages over the last 10 years, average margins, peak levels that they've had before and stuff are all logical ways of thinking about it, how cheap it might be, at least in terms of the upside. Mm -hmm. So which would you rather own? We don't own any of them, but just curious at these levels, at this point in the market, with what we know about the yield curve going forward or the forward curve, which uh, bank would you rather own? Um, well, I would probably rather own Frost. However, some of that may be that my expectations for the future might be different than other people's or the probabilities weighted differently or something. So if that wasn't the case, then I might not feel as strongly that way. I mean, there's some predictions from people that rates are that like tenure and stuff is going to go to 3% really soon. If that kind of thing happens and we get, and I think the Fed has penciled in that a normal Fed funds rate is in the long run is two and a half percent or something like that. It's something along those lines, which with 2% inflation is 0.5% real, which is extremely low. So I don't know that we'll get to rates like that sustainably for a long time. I mean, when we talk about all this stuff, the short term things are what they are. But the long term reality is federal government has debt. There's different ways of measuring it, but any way you measure it, no matter how favorably you're at over 100% um, debt to GDP. Uh, expectations for the primary deficit are like 3.5% or something. Um, if you look back to when we've had inflation back in, say, the 80s or something, that was manageable, but there was inflation. Um, you started that period at maybe one-third the debt level that you have now, and your primary deficit was maybe one and a half percent a year or something versus three and a half percent projected. Now it's just the sustainability of it is not the the credit quality of the United States and stuff is much lower. Um, And so that is more like what determines long-term inflation issues. If you just end up having to have too much money, Um, there's not a lot that I, I don't, I mean, we've talked about this before in theory, a central bank can, control inflation, but the only method it has to do that is to offset the things that be causing the inflation with rates that are sufficient to do that. So it can only really do that by making it so that you're unwilling to spend and stuff, um, which when there's that much new money coming in each year could be very hard to do with anything but very high rates. So in theory, you can control it, but it, you know, what does that mean? Are you willing to take it to any level? um short-term rates to to stop inflation so i just am more skeptical of that i mean the situation is very different in 2008 than it was in 2000 than it is now i mean when i started investing the the expectations were for a primary surplus um you know late 90s early 2000s and just the entire situation in terms of what was likely to be presenting inflation problems was so much better it's deteriorated a lot over 20 years. Um, and in particular, it's deteriorated in many places since the financial crisis. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you are joining us, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening or watching us here today. Uh, go to focuscompound.com to get access to investment write-ups going all the way back to 2005. And of course, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at andrew at focusedcompounding.com. I thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.